joining us. I'm Josh McKelvin. This has certainly been a whirlwind couple of months or so of the new government in Washington. President Trump has dominated the headlines as usual. And then to this point, the new Republican held Congress is yet to pass any major legislation that reshapes policy. So what's going to happen and what kind of say will Democrats have during this process? Here to talk about it this morning is Senator Maggie Hassan. Good to see you, ma'am. Nice to see you. Are you missing Concord at all? Oh, I always miss New Hampshire quite a bit, but I'm also really honored to be where I am. Sure, you've obviously been very busy and there's no, hadn't had a whole lot of a honeymoon period down there in Washington. A lot of things have been working on, but let's start with this administration, some of the cabinet picks uh, and immigration. We'll start there. Obviously, uh, the travel ban created a lot of controversy. Uh, your appointment to the Homeland Security uh, uh, Committee, Homeland Security Director said today that there won't be any enforcement and mass roundups of immigration. How do you think things are going as far as the dialogue is concerned? Well, so first of all, my priorities in Washington are the priorities uh, that I really focused on as governor, too. They're the ones that the people of New Hampshire talked to me about. How do we expand middle class opportunity? How do we support innovative job creating businesses? How do we keep our country safe, secure, strong and free? And so those are always uh, the priorities that I look at uh, from my role on Homeland Security, I continue to be very concerned about what we learned uh, just as this new administration was taking office about the involvement that Russia apparently had in really working to undermine our electoral process and really try to influence the outcome of this election. So I've joined with fellow Democrats on Homeland Security Committee to ask our uh, chairman to launch an investigation into what kind of influence or impact Russia had on our electoral processes. That's obviously critical infrastructure and it's essential to our democracy. It, it, voting is the thing uh, that we all have to do to ensure that our country is safe and strong and free. And so I stay very focused on wanting to understand um, what influence Russia had. And obviously uh, a concern that we all have about this administration is that the president may have conflicts in terms of his business interests or ties in Russia. We're not quite clear. His administration uh, and campaign, it sounds like, uh, had contact with Russia and we don't have a full understanding of the kind of conflicts that may exist there. So I remain very concerned about uh, the first few weeks of this administration, the lack of disclosure and transparency when it comes to Russia, uh, the apparent lack of interest in really uh, pursuing Russia. And uh, I continue to be concerned about the conflicts of interest, not only from the president's point of view, but from some of his cabinet picks too. When it, when it comes to this investigation, what are we looking for fundamentally? Because uh, the president said or through Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, he said, I'm okay with my guys talking to Russian officials before we actually took the oath of office. That's, that's what their job is. And obviously he le left under circumstances more related to trust than anything else. Is is it uh, are you looking for that smoking gun when it comes to involvement in the election and coordination with the you Trump know, campaign? It, I think the question on the minds of a lot of Americans and a lot of Granite Staters I talk to is here is a President Trump who talks so tough about other governments, uh, governments that have been our allies uh, for decades. Um, and yet when it comes to Russia, he seems to make excuses for them. That just raises these questions about what kind of conflicts of interest he may have um, and the fact that he didn't seem concerned that Lieutenant General Flynn uh, may have talked to the Russians not just about the niceties of the holidays or logistics about phone calls or meetings, but about what the new administration's actions may be in terms of sanctions at a time when I think most of us agree that we should be increasing our sanctions against Russia, given uh, the clear evidence that our intelligence community has released about their work to undermine our elections. It is just very strange that uh, the president seems so soft on Russia when he talks so tough about everybody else. And so that's an ongoing concern. Uh, and I think we're going to see uh, Democrats and I hope we'll be joined by some Republicans. We do hear some Republicans expressing concern on intelligence, judiciary, homeland security and foreign relations to really get to the bottom of what's been going on here. Uh, let's get back to immigration. Uh, obviously, the, the courts had their say when it came to the president's travel ba uh, ban and the executive order. I'm interested in getting your take on this because you made some headlines as governor saying that, you know, you have some concerns about the vetting of uh, refugees coming into this country. Well, first of all, overall, 
overall, we certainly need to make sure that our borders are secure. And that's something I've supported both as governor uh, and now in the United States Senate. Uh, but we also have to be true to our American values. And the ban, the executive order that the president issued is an un-American ban, backdoor ban on Muslims. It has a religious basis to it. It's not constitutional. It's un-American. I would never support anything like that. I still think we should be working on strengthening all of our vetting processes, but we should do it in a way that's transparent uh, and true to our American values. And uh, the president's executive order certainly didn't do that. Are you convinced that the improvements have been made since your time uh, as governor and now in the Senate? Have you had a chance to look at it all? Well, I, I still think we are all focused on not only uh, the vetting of refugees, which is one of the most stringent vetting processes we have, uh, but it's always worth looking at these things and seeing how we can improve. At the time, um, now over a year ago, when I was governor and I called for a temporary pause, we had heard concerns from the FBI and the CIA about some of the processes. And so I think it's always wise uh, to listen to our national security and law enforcement experts. But we have to always be true to our American values and we have to be part of a response to a humanitarian crisis. That's who we are as Americans. How concerned are you about the approach that we that we see from this president from time to time, the things that he says via Twitter or you know, during a uh, off-the-cuff news conference or speech that perhaps wasn't exactly drafted, whether we're talking about uh, Mexico or things that may or may not have happened in Sweden. I mean, is there fundamentally a flaw when it comes to uh, our relations with other countries? I, you know, I, I think back to my grandmother reminding me that it's always wise to take a minute and think about what you're going to say uh, because you can't pull it back. Words do have meaning. And uh, what we're seeing with this president is that he says things that uh, cause great concern uh, from our allies, uh, from potential allies, um, and that he seems to speak off the cuff and uh, be inconsistent and create a lot of confusion. And I think what we always should be doing is looking to um, find a way to express American values, uh, to really make sure that we're acting from a position of strength, but also from a position of um, American values, which means that we want to include people, we want to support our democratic process, we want to be leaders that demonstrate through our own actions and our own words uh, what it means to be a democracy and what it means to honor all human beings and honor freedom. And I sometimes get concerned uh, that the president's off-the-cuff remarks or tweets really undermine uh, our capacity to be the kind of example we'd like to be in the world. As you pointed out, the Republican members of Congress, some of them have been, have been critical of this president. Are you finding that that is actually giving the Democratic minority a bit of a louder voice because you have some like-minded people that might be across the aisle on particular issues. You know, what I, what I try to focus on in the United States Senate is doing my job as a senator, which it, it, right now, given that we have a new administration, it has really been focused of uh, mostly on the confirmation process as well as some of the legislative issues that have come to us. And our job is to listen and learn about nominees and then to exercise our role to advise and consent as to the nomination. And I think what you're seeing is a group of senators in both parties trying really hard to do that. Um, I wish that a, at least one more of uh, my Republican colleagues had joined with us when uh, we raised questions about the qualifications of the Secretary of Education, uh, Ms. DeVos, who seemed to be really um, inexperienced and not nearly as knowledgeable as you would expect from a nominee for the Secretary of Education about critical issues that affect all of our children. And so uh, I know that there are uh, people in both parties who want to make sure that uh, we're really thinking through what we're doing and really working to do our job to vet the nominees that the administration has put forward. Uh, I'm having a, you know, I'm having meetings with members of both parties and getting to know my colleagues, and I know that we all take this very seriously. Yeah, you've been very uh, outspoken about your uh, opposition to the education secretary. Is there something to be said, though, uh, uh, for the cabinet choices, whether it's Rex Tillerson or DeVos, something yeah. like that? They may not have the background in that particular area, but have been experts in the private sector or whatever in facilitating communication and getting things done. Well, that's certainly part of what you look at in terms of what kind of qualifications and experience and perspective people bring to the table. But you also 
have to evaluate people in terms of their readiness to take on the role of leading a, a major policy area in the United States government. What concerned me was not just Ms. DeVos's lack of qualifications and experience in public education, was her lack and her lack of familiarity with basic civil rights protections that have been critical to the progress of so many of our young people, but she also had views um, about uh, voucher systems and supporting private education uh, without requiring any accountability from these private educators that really concerned me on a policy basis. Uh, we shouldn't be spending public dollars mm. on educational entities without requiring them to be accountable and actually show that they are qualified to educate our kids. And she really uh, was resistant and was unwilling to say that she was she wanted to hold private schools accountable. Well, you've also been very active in uh, advocating for solutions uh, when it comes to New Hampshire's opioid crisis. What do you say we take a quick break? Talk about that when we come back. I'd love that. Thank All you. Right.